right, everybody. I want to welcome you to the uh, 31st Pathworking uh, online class. And uh, to begin with, uh, I'd like to talk about the, the people's work with the 32nd Pathworking over the past two weeks. Uh, so uh, today we're going to talk for part of the time about your experiences with the 32nd path working, and then the second half of the time we'll talk about the 31st path working, or maybe slightly less than, well, we'll see how it goes. Um, but so to begin with, um, did everyone who's here right now manage to um, work with the 32nd path working a bit over the past couple of weeks? I hope, since it's been two weeks rather than one. And so I'll begin with an open-ended question. What were your experiences like? Um, and I'll also throw out another question while people are perhaps answering that in their, um, their chat boxes, which is, did anyone have any problems or concerns with the 30-second path working that they want to ask a question about? Well, good. I'm glad you enjoyed it, Robin. One of the things that I want to mention um, is that the beginning of most of these recordings is basically almost identical. So the first part in which you do the progressive relaxation and the entry into your inner temple um, that's basically going to be the same in each one, all the way up through the um, initial Kabbalistic invocation. Um, so that is going to be consistent throughout all of them. And um, it's just going to be the actual path and the, the, where it goes itself that's slightly, that, you know, that, that changes fairly dramatically. Um, so uh, Alex from Edmonton, Canada says it was very changing in the sense that my outside life changed. Well, you've got to um, you got to give us a little bit of uh, you know give give, give us a <laughs> an indication of what you mean by that. And uh, Robin uh, asked a question on the vortex: uh, Should they be built always as spatially overhead? Uh, well, I'm going to tell you how I visualize them, and I don't think that there's really a right or wrong here. Um, I, I visualize them at about I would say a 30 to 35 degree angle above, um, you know, so so that you're so that you're, you're you are moving upward, but it's not at a directly overhead kind of way. And the reason for that partially is because, um, and you'll discover with the path of Sheen that's coming up this week, that um, you're going to be going off to the left because you're basically following the ground plan of the tree of life as you as you move through these paths. So the ones that go off towards the left, go off towards the left, the ones that go off to the right, go off to the right, and the ones that go up to the center of the tree, go up the center of the tree. So you're going to find that there's directionality to the, to the, the path that you're going down. Um, and uh, the, um, the vortexes themselves can be directly in front of you, if you like, or mostly overhead. Um, like I said, I like to I like to see them as sort of somewhat overhead, somewhat you know moving overhead, but still with a clear directionality to them. Um, uh, and Alex says uh, that that uh, Alex, you're are, I'm assuming that you're a boy. There are girl Alexes, but Alex says that uh, unless you, you correct me wrong, says that he sometimes tends to dream to dream off when he gets to Yasad. Um, uh, so Robin says the first vortex. Uh, are, now, Robin, are you a girl or boy? Because <laughs> Robin's also. You guys are. You guys have all these ambiguous uh, gender names. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, so Robin is a girl. Um, first vortex I had taken head on. The second vortex went overhead. Uh, what you say then makes sense. Thank you. Um, yeah. I mean, and that and that works. That works perfectly well. Um, 
And the the oh, oh oh I remember something that I wanted to mention, which is just a general truism about these recordings, is that right at the beginning, and I don't think that I did it once you get into the paths themselves, but right at the beginning there are some right left um, things going on with the with the audio. So you might want to make sure you have your right headphones on your right ear and your left headphones on your left ear just to avoid confusion. I meant to mention that last time, and I did it. Um, and uh, there's another thing that I want to mention. I'll get to that uh, a little later. But um, Alex from Edmonton says, sure, the feelings that I used uh, to open the vortex were related to specific anger and depression in my daily life after doing the meditation. Those particular dif difficult feelings disappeared and were replaced by clearer thinking. Well, that's wonderful to hear. That's exactly what I want for you to be doing with this stuff, is particularly focusing on practical things that matter to you. I think that's one of the one of the... Um, flaws that I see in a lot, the way that a lot of people approach um, the Western mystery tradition is that it, it's it's done so um, up here in, in the in the head and in, in the theoretical um, landscape rather than uh, viscerally and how it actually applies to our lives. Um, you know, I mean, there's there's whole really wonderful courses, but they really don't they don't get into your actual day to day living and what's going on in your life. So I'm glad that you were using it in that way. Um, I think that might be the end of the questions. Uh, <laughs> Rebecca says that she's old. She, so does that mean that you're neither a girl nor a boy? You're, you're a crone? Um, so uh, the, the, the path, <laughs> Rebecca says she can't tell anymore. Um, the, the path of Tao. Uh, takes us, um, you know, in, into that into that etheric astral realm, and, and I think Alex was mentioning uh, that he tends to you know, slip off into a, a dreamy state in that place, and that you know, and that's really where you are heading. You're heading into that you know into that um, uh, subconscious area, the area of dreams, and the area of uh, visions, and the area of like subconscious drives and subconscious patterns that are going on in your life. So um, in doing this path working, my hope for you is for you to, you know, approach those things, those fears that are right at that, at what they call the limin, you know, the, the, the area between consciousness and unconsciousness that are affecting your life in a way that you don't necessarily control and actually work through those and eliminate them so that you can pass back and forth into that subconscious state without those things interfering with you. Um, <laughs> I, some people are talking about uh, age, I guess. Uh, Alex is asking for suggestions for retaining control in that, um, you know, that dreamy state to explore more. Well, so the um, the Frequency of practice is going to be the, the most important thing, um, but also having clear signposts and having clear purposes is going to be another thing that helps you. You know, when you're just when you're just sort of oh, I want to um, you know see what this is like, you're going to tend to you know lose lose lucidity. Whereas if you have a specific kind of um, agenda in mind, uh, in, in this case, clearing the um, you know the the, the the fear patterns that are going on in your life, that should help you in some way. And, and it may be that you need to pass a little bit into unconsciousness in order to process some of that information. And it's not something to, to necessarily be feared. Now, um, that dreamy space is not necessarily where we want to be going for the, for the rest of, of these things. Now, this next path that's coming up is going to take you into a different kind of a, a, kind of a place. And the, I, the, the archetypal essence of it is to be in that inspired state, almost a prophetic state or a state of um, inspired creativity, uh, but also sort of an, an, uh, uh, an open understanding of the universe uh, that is uh, free form and, and without uh, a lot of rules attached to it. Um, and so now Rebecca's going into something about uh, her life. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, excuse me for a moment while I read what she's written here. Uh, Rebecca says, for instance, I went back to school for nursing after the crash in 08, after 30 plus years in broadcasting, now want to be a nurse. 
I have no idea why, but I panic in classes that are vital to my degrees. I've been nervous about this new semester, and I want to get out of my own way. Hmm. Well, um, now, I mean, this is, a, this is a perfect thing to deal with. But this, this pathworking can be useful. There's also some new hermetics tools that might be useful for you in that as well, turning pain into pleasure, um, balancing the elements. Those would be useful um, tools for you. I don't know if you have those recordings or, or if you're familiar with my work uh, with the hermetics at all, but, but those, are, those are things that, um, that might be useful for you in, in that. But just you know, being with the experience, for instance, the, uh, the nervousness about the new semester, being with that and watching it and being conscious of it is going to transform it. It's going to change what it is to you. Um, and so moving through that into the, into the Yisod state through this path working is an incredibly um, powerful thing to do. It's, it's, a, it's a way of recognizing the impermanence and the, the non-actual the non nature of that, of that experience. It's just a feeling state that you've created in yourself. You know, you've created the meaning that it has, the negative, um, the negative connotations and the way that it affects you moving into the future. But if you just sit with it and cease to define it and allow yourself to just move through it, it, it no longer has that same meaning anymore. Well, um, OK, so Alex mentions that the, the class on demons was very helpful for that. And I, yeah, I think that that's true, too. Uh, Rurik says, I was under the impression that these recordings are generative rather than remedial. Well, I, I, I yes, they are, Rurik, but, but, but there's, I mean, we all have a little bit of um, remedial work to do along the, along the generative path. You know, there's, there's, we each have um, things that we're carrying with us that are, that are weighing us down, and that's essentially what the work is, is putting those things down. So um, I don't think that there's necessarily a, a clear-cut um, distinction between those two things in, in the case of spiritual growth. Uh, I think that there are some people who would like to make them that way, but I don't. I think that that's not necessarily the best thing because I think there's too many people who, um, you know, call themselves enlightened masters who still have a lot of personality defects and, and vice versa. Do so you like to have a lot of meltdowns, Rebecca? Well, uh, Reginald asked an interesting question, which is uh, the difference between the Tao path and the, the Western working in the Jewish tradition. Um, you know, in the, there, there isn't really a, a, a comparable path working system in the Jewish tradition, um, at, least, at least insofar as I understand the, the tradition. Um, so th this kind of work is, is unique to the Western tradition, and it's actually a fairly modern innovation. I don't think that it, it I mean, it, the seeds of it were sowed in the, in the early 1900s, and I don't think that path working per se really became what it is now until the 50s and 60s. Um, you know, I mean, you, if you look at the if you look at the work of the um, the Golden Dawn adepts that's recorded, there's a few of them recorded here and there, and they, it's somewhat similar to pathworking. And then you look at some of the work that Alistair Crowley made a little bit later, you see where kind of pathworking comes in, but the actual um, the, uh, the the work as we're doing it now that, that I'm suggesting is my own. It hasn't. It really isn't um, the the Golden Dawn, or the Aleister Crowley, or the Jewish tradition. Um, within the Jewish tradition, uh, Tao ends up being in, in a couple of different places. Usually, it actually sits in the same position that, that it is in um, the Western one, which is you know the final position, simply because it is the last letter. But almost all the, all the rest of them switch around to other places. Um, and I, yeah, I want to I want to say that it, it in a, in, a, in some of the Jewish traditions, that there's three mother letters. Um, seven single letters and 12 double letters, or is that 12 single letters and seven double letters? I, I'm, I'm not as, forgive me, forgive my, uh, my poor memory on this stuff. I haven't thought about it in a while, but the, um, the, uh, the, those, uh, those correspond to, uh, certain, like there's three 
um, horizontal paths that go through the tree. And so the three mother letters often are put into there. And then there's, uh, I want to say there's the seven of the, of the, the uh, upward and downward, the vertical vertical paths, and, and, that's, and they get put in there, and then 12 of the horizontal paths, and they get put in there. I think that's the way that it, it's often done. Um, so tau still ends up being at, that, at the end there um, as, as one of the uh, um, ones that, you know, is, is uh, horizontal, or I mean vertical, I uh, forgive me. But um, the, uh, so I mean, it, it operates in a similar, in a similar sense, but the, but the Jewish understanding of the, of the sephira is kind of different than, um, than the, than the Western magical one. So the, 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 the comparison is, is a little hard when you get, you know, when you really take a, a good hard look at the systems. And, uh, you know, for me, the magical one is much more meaningful just because I've been so involved in the tarot and I've been so involved in the, um, the four elements and uh, the, you know, the, the, the model of the, you know, of the universe that's based on the planets and the zodiac and, all, these things are in the in the Jewish system. They're a lot more muddled up because I don't think they really cared about that aspect as much as the analysis of the of the biblical passages and trying to make sense of certain things that don't actually make any sense in the Bible. Um, and that was where their minds were going. They were going, "How can we make? You know, obviously we know the Bible is, you know, this this book that's divine, but it doesn't really. A lot of it doesn't really make a lot of sense. So there must be a hidden Kabbalistic meaning in there, and that's." And that's really more where you see a lot of um, uh, the the Jewish Kabbalah really being done. Other and then the mystical practices are largely you know different ways of saying the divine name and, and um, uh, different ways of uh, turn you know, of um, moving letters around in order to try and find new meanings and things. And so it's not it's not as focused on on um, other planes as uh, the Western magical model is. Um, so I, I hope that answers your question, Rachel. When, okay, so there's just a bunch of people correcting my, my information here. Um, and Rebecca says that she had two meltdowns that, uh, in her, wait, no, had, uh, she had a meltdown in her la schedule last semester, and so she went down to two classes. Now she's determined to overcome. Well, good, Rebecca. I mean, that's important for you to, you know, um, take control of your life and do with it as you, you know, want to, and, and not allow, you know, the the inner monsters in your head to to establish control. So let's let's talk a little bit more about the thirty second path. Um, does anyone have any comments or uh, thoughts upon? Um, they're just like to share as a group or ask me a question about. Reginald's saying something. No. Reginald's saying Jeffrey answer. Okay, if no one has anything more to say about the 32nd path, then we will move to the 31st path. Now, um, okay, Rebecca. So, uh, Rebecca, what I would suggest to you uh, is we're going to have uh, another two weeks uh, between this. Um, hold on a second, Rachel. Uh, in between this present class and the next one. So um, take the first week and try and listen to the 30-second path working a couple of times. And then, you know, if, you, if you're getting some benefit from that, then the second week listen to the 31st path working. That way you can keep up. And it's okay if you get behind. I'd still, I'd still love for you to come to the classes even if you're, you know, not up to date with everything that's going on. Um, uh, so Reginald asks, in what teachings? Um, well, I mean, in, in what sense of NLP do you, are you asking that question? I mean, I, I use a lot of, um, I use a lot of, I mean, obviously the, the uh, 
path organs themselves are, are metaphors, and so in that sense, they're using language models in order to communicate information. So, I mean, NLP kind of is a just a way of kind of organizing communication and understanding communication. So, um, uh, oh, the sun child. Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. Remind me of that at the end, Alex, and, and I'll and I'll try and get that done today. Send that off to um, this list anyway. But so uh, so NLP is a um, you know a, a way of modeling experience. So I certainly have have used my modeling skills in creating a lot of the stuff that's involved in here. Um, I use a lot of um, suggestion within the recordings themselves. And so, I mean, that's hypnotic, but also NLP. Um, there's uh, a lot of um, uh, Milton model aspects of um, NLP that I use, uh, leading people through um, using a lot of uh, nominalizations in an intentional way in order to guide people towards their own self-discovery. Um, so, I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty intrinsic in what I do, but I, I explicitly not a huge part of these particular recordings. There isn't, you know, I don't say, hey, now let's, now let's do the uh, new behavior generator or hey, let's uh, let's do the um, the circle of excellence. But I mean, those things are kind of built into a lot of the stuff that I do. Does that make sense, Reginald? Yes, I mean, but personal experience. Modeling my own experience and those and those um, who I you know I've observed doing the work in a way that I think is effective. Um, that's what that's what I use to to create the recordings and my model for the recording. Uh, Graham asks, so we don't come back to Malkuth. Uh, this is slightly uncommon for this work, isn't it? Are you referring to, to further on down the road uh, recordings? Because um, because what I don't do is I don't take you back through the you know as we as we move along, you're going to kind of at the beginnings you're going to kind of raise your your vibration up to the the place where it begins, and then I just bring you back. But I mean the the, the recordings do end you know come back to your to your inner temple as far as I. I think they do anyway. Maybe they don't. Um, th you know, we're we're in Malkut, so I mean, I, I'm bringing you back either way to that. So um, I think that you know, to a large extent, I didn't want I want people to move into those states and have them or those you know places and have them available to their consciousness. Uh, so you know, I, I, in a way, I, I'd like you to walk away from your experiences kind of in those places and integrating that stuff. So I don't I don't see it as totally necessary. But I thought that I had you come back and into your inner temple at the end. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Okay, so there's a bunch of bunch of stuff here. And yeah, Reginald says, okay, thanks. Graham says, you don't come, oh wait, no, I got this, uh, Oscar says, what do you think about the shadow? Um, we, we actually will address the shadow to an extent. Uh, my hair is driving me nuts, it's tickling my forehead. We'll actually come back to the shadow, um, or come to the shadow at a certain point within this, and, and it is incorporated into uh, one of the paths, maybe more than one. Um, And Rurik says, uh, NLP is for discovering and mapping structure in subjectivity. NLP techniques are another story. Yeah, I agree with you, Rurik. There, there are two different things. Um, and I think that it, to a large extent, NLP, as we popularly think of it, has been co-opted by those, by those techniques rather than its, its inherent uh, modeling capacities, which I think are much more interesting and valuable. 
um, personally, because I think that those the tool the techniques you know they they work you know to a large extent, uh, but they don't always work on everybody. And so if you don't have a flexibility within them, then you're you know kind of stuck with a, with a tool that only sort of works. Um, Brendan and Kevin. Uh, Kevin says, we live in Malkuth daily, so we don't need to be taken there. Yeah, that's, that's true. Uh, Alex says, personally speaking, I like it better than than banishing everything all the time and losing what you gain. Yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of where my head has been at for a while. It's like, you know, why are we why are we setting up all these beautiful structures in our in our consciousness and then just going, but then now we're done and we'll put all that away and go back to being the ineffective, unenlightened person that we were before. Um, Robin says, I too like it better to be suggested to go out and live your life. Yeah. Uh, it was looking a little Supermanish, wasn't it? Alex says that he thought my forelock was an intentional Superman illusion. <laughs> can you, how much of my Superman shirt can you see? <laughs> I was planning I was planning on dressing nicely again today, but my, my wife put um, our new baby into his little Superman shirt, so I, I wore mine to, to go along with it. Um, so I think there's a for those of you who are friends of mine on Facebook, I think there's probably a picture up on Facebook of, of us together. Um, I didn't put it up, but somebody I think did. Um, so let's move on to the path of Sheen, uh, so that we don't use up all of our time on um, Malkut. And it seems like we're we're timing that rather well. Uh, oh, Reginald has a question about spirits. This is a complex question, Reginald. Um, and I think that uh, they, uh, you know it's a that's a that's a you know a hot button issue, isn't it? Um, I don't personally. I don't. I don't see those two things as being in, as as distinct as as you might. So you know, I mean, we're all we're all a part of consciousness. That's really the part of us that it is. You know, this this flesh and bones. Jason, that flesh and bones, Reginald, those are just really temporary things that are going to cease to exist before we even know it. The eternal is what flows through us, animates us, and then moves on to other forms. And spirits are part of that eternal. So uh, some of them exist more in our heads, and some of them exist more out of our heads. But I don't think that the distinction is um, as clear cut as some people would like it to be. So, path of Sheen. Now, the way that we're approaching the path of Sheen is uh, largely um, related to the Golden Dawn uh, model. Uh, in in that uh, in in their version of Sefer Yetzirah, the um, the path of Sheen has to do with the element of fire. I believe that actually holds true in, in, in the other one as well. Um, uh, in you know in, in, in classic Sephiroth, I think it's just the planets and the uh, zodiac signs that get mingled up. So I think the elemental ones are the same. Uh, so um, the way that we're approaching it mythically is um, as being as having to cross through something in which we cannot cross in our in our in the current way that we are um, the metaphor that's used is as a, as a hot desert in which we have to pass basically through fire and, and this is you know this basic idea is represented in um, scripture you know that, that you're the, uh, that you're baptized by water and fire and the Holy Spirit um, th this is a, the baptism of fire in which we are purged of, of all that isn't a holy, um, and this is kind of the first time that we're really shedding this sort of stuff. And, and so, what we're going after is um, a lot of the personality structures that you're just going to allow to to disappear for the moment, and they aren't necessarily going to disappear forever um, at this stage, but just simply move past them into a into a, a place in your consciousness in which they aren't the case. So, what I wanted to talk about a little bit before we get into too much about the path itself was really the concepts that I'm referring to here. Um, and the metaphor that I thought of was that um, when you go and live in a foreign country, 
for a long time, where they speak a different language. You begin to speak in that language, not only verbally, outwardly to the people that you interact with, but also inwardly in your own mind. It changes into that language pattern. And those language patterns have their own inherent structures and their own assumptions about the universe. And so those patterns begin to embed themselves in your consciousness. So in other words, if you go and live on a native island for 10 years, most people end up being more like the native islanders after 10 years rather than like their old selves. They don't feel the same way about the world that they do. So those are the habit patterns and structures of consciousness that I'm talking about here. And when you join a, a secret society or a group or a club that consumes a tremendous amount of your time, you also begin to take on those values and those beliefs um, and, those, and those structures into yourself. When you go to, uh, to, when you receive higher education and you learn a vocation or uh, you, know, you become a doctor or a lawyer, or, or you're, you're trained to think in certain ways, um, to, to have certain beliefs about the universe, uh, to have certain behaviors in your life that have to do with that trade and that way of looking at the world. And those, those change the way you are. So those are all different examples of parts of our consciousness that are created by our circumstances, by our environment, and by the choices that we make in life. They limit us in various ways, and they open us to, up to opportunities in various ways. However, they're limiting. And so... We, in order to move forward spiritually, we need to shed a lot of those things, at least when we're working spiritually. In our day-to-day -day life, they will be shed over time, but while you're moving into these spiritual places, you need to set them aside for that time period. Now, this idea is present in most religions and, most, and particularly most initiatory secret societies. Um, you gain admission to the organization through some sort of a, a ceremony or a purification or a, um, an indoctrination or some sort of a, a thing. And often they, they involve removing your old self and creating a new self. Um, you know, in, in uh, Christian, Christianity, you're baptized and you're confirmed. And those various things are, are various forms of initiation into the thing. And you, you even, in some, some forms, you even receive a new name or a, a baptismal name you know, that's separate from your, from your identity. In most sort of magical secret societies, the same sort of thing happens. You're, you're put through an experience and you're given a new, a new name within the organization that is your new identity. Um, and some things are expected to be dropped away. You know, you're no longer going to be doing certain things now that you're a part of this organization, you're going to have a different kind of an existence. Now, uh, and that is what we're talking about with this particular path. It, in many ways, is the path of initiation. It's the path of, you know, the, the, um, the path of Tao is the, the, the first steps into the spiritual dimension. The path of Shin is the initiation, the, the trial by fire by which we kind of move into being whole member of the spiritual body that we're, that we're moving into. And the, the body that, that I'm encouraging you to join is a more universal, um, less uh, <laughs> kind of a spirituality um, in which you're just going to be open to uh, self-discovery and the discovery of what's out there rather than um, being taught a specific set of rules and behaviors, which is often what's on the other side of, of initiation. You know, you're given a trial by fire, and instead of and instead of being, um, you know, just opened up to pure awareness, you're taught a new set of rules and behaviors that you're then supposed to adopt instead of your old ones, um, which to me seems a little bit, one, antiquated, and two, sort of self-defeating. Um, so... I'm going to show you a few images like I did last time of the, the tarot card that is associated with this path. And I think that, um, uh, I think that you'll see a little bit. First, I'll show you uh, the, the Rider weight one, which is you know, quite similar, obviously, to the one for the BOTA and, and um, uh, somewhat related to the classic, like Marseille one. But uh, so you see what's depicted here is Judgment Day, which, of course, is 
the final initiation, <laughs> right? It's the it's the passage from this world into the eternal world, um, and and the what's depicted is all the people rising up out of their graves. Um, the, the Michael or uh, Gabriel, excuse me, with his horn, uh, waking everybody up, uh, and and that's you know that's that's what the image was depicted here. Um, now, the Golden Dawn, um, and this is just this is again this is Tabby Cicero's version of this this image, and there are, there are a few others. Uh, this is pretty close to um, what is you know the traditional Golden Dawn image, but you know, she's taken her own artistic license with it. Uh, but so it's a similar image, uh, but instead of uh, just just some people rising up out of the grave. There's some fairly spe they're specific people, and they have to do with the Samothracian mysteries, and we're not going to get into that too much. Um, but she's also got sort of like a little bit of a um, an allusion to Horus or Ra um, in in the person who's rising, um, and there's also this sort of golden dawn triangle thing in there as well. Um, Uh, okay, I'll try and pull it back a little bit so you can see it better. It's 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 such an intricate picture that it's difficult to uh, really. Do. But so there's a uh, there's two there's a man here, there's uh, two women here, and there's a person, a male I think here, and, and you can see the Hebrew letter sheen uh, there uh, in the image. Now, so. Um, Alistair Crowley, in his version of this card, takes a and and, and you, you you can kind of get a sense of where he's going from this card, um, which is uh, slightly different than the classic image. But Alistair Crowley went a step further and he identified this with his own sort of new eon um, thinking. And so you see a, a pretty different card here with uh, you know uh, the the rise of rock wheat um, happening and. Uh, there's sort of a squishy new eat in the background here, but I mean some of the some of the imagery is similar. You've still got the sheen down here. Uh, you've still got the sense of sort of things rising up or, or transforming. Um, and so his idea was basically it's not the um, yeah. Alex mentions that these images are available online as well, so you can you can look them up uh, elsewhere and get a better <laughs> image. Um, so. Uh, his idea was that that instead of the last judgment, that at the time that what was represented in in the the Christian apocalypse, the, you know the uh, the Saint John was um, actually the transition from one eon to another, and so uh, he actually changed the name from the last judgment to the eon. Um, so it, it, so he's representing that you know it's it's just a change of one era to another. I'm not, we're not going to get into that too much, um, but so my image. Um, I kind of stuck with a little bit closer to the the Golden Dawn uh, version of it. You've still got you've got so you've got that man and the two women, which represent some of the Zamothracian mysteries. Um, you've got the sheen. You've got you've got the, this grave here being risen out of. Uh, but then I've got this sort of, and this is interesting because I did this long before I did these path workings. But so <laughs> you can actually see sort of a sense of of what uh, you know one of these one of these vortexes might might look like. Here, so uh, I think that one's kind of, this is kind of an interesting card, and in it does sort of show that. Um, again, I've got the triangle here, but um, so uh, what's being represented in these images, from you know, from a, a, a mystical point of view, is is a, a, a transition from one period to another, um, it, from one state of being to another. The Last Judgment, the end of um, you know the or the worldly period of the universe into the eternal period of the universe, the um, the eon, the representation of the transition from the you know the age of Osiris into the age of Horus. Um, <laughs> the wording at the bottom of that is "et in Arcadia ego," and and that's that's uh, it was it was kind of a personal joke. Uh, you can try and figure it out if you want to. Um, but uh, anyway, I'm sure some people know exactly what I'm. Um, there's a painting of a of a grave. 
So, um, from the invisible. I think that that makes the same illusion. I think, uh, but but yeah, it, it's a, there's a painting and it's associated with some stuff. It, um, it's it's not really that relevant to it, other than the fact that I like that um, the Ed and Arcadia ego is, is uh, it's a it's a um, it's a phrase that doesn't really quite have an ending. It there needs there isn't some it, there needs to be another word in it. So it's like a, it's a, like dot dot dot, you know. Um, so um, I like that about it. It just means you know, and and in Arcadia I. Arcadia being the uh, the mythical land of uh, it's like the plot that's like the happy hunting grounds in Greek mythology, sort of. Um, so awakening, the clarion call to the illuminate mind. Yes. yes. Uh, now and so uh, Rebecca is saying that she painted something uh, that she burned. Sounds like you have a lot of um, ups and downs, Rebecca. I would recommend relaxing and, and uh, trying to, you know, keep a more even keel. I don't think I've ever burned any of my art, although I do know lots of artists who do that, and that is a very artistic thing to do. Um, and burning is actually appropriate to, to this particular path, since um, it does have to do with fire. Uh, and so, um, the when we when we move from one state to another, we often can't bring things with us. You can't be both an American and a you know a, a Bushman from Africa. You can't have both sensibilities going on in your mind. So in order to move from one to another, you sacrifice a lot of what you previously were to move into the into the new place. And that's really what this path has to do with is, is ridding ourselves of some baggage and some stuff that is no longer serving us as we move into our more open spiritual state. Um, the, the, the state of HUD that, um, that, that, we're, that we're aiming for in this um, uh, recording set is a, a, is a fairly mystic place. It's a um, the, uh, the illuminated mind is a good way of describing it, Graham. You know, it's a um, it's a very open and uh, non uh, non judgmental, but not uh, a clarity of vision about the universe and one's place in the universe and and things that have nothing to do with one's place at all, uh, but an open understanding of the cosmic mind, so to speak. And our our intrinsic connection with it. It's a it's a pretty um, you know in a, in a if you open yourself fully to the experience that's available to you in this recording, it's a pretty advanced spiritual state. And it's interesting because it's really right just at the beginning. So um, you know there's a lot more <laughs> past here, and there's a lot more thing. There's a lot more opportunities to unload more of this baggage as we go along. So don't feel like you need to have unloaded every aspect of your personality complex in order to, um, to move forward. Because uh, I know some of you are perfectionists, and that's, that's a personality complex, being a perfectionist. Um, so that has to go, too. But um, it's not all going to go away from, from just listening to these recordings. So, um, but this is an opportunity for you to shed it for a time, and then you'll reintegrate, and then shed it again for a time, and then you'll reintegrate, and then shed it again, and eventually the parts of you that are eternal, the parts of you that are the, that are the true nature of the essence of what you are, are going to become clearer and clearer to you as you let go of things. Um, so, Rebecca, uh, thank you. I've actually visualized it much more frequently now, the sense of emanating light from within and reaching outward. I think I just realized that I helped myself by burning it. It burned into my brain. We'll never forget the image. Wow. There you go. So, you know, sometimes, sometimes ridding ourselves of a physical object. So Rebecca is, um, is, is creating a metaphor, I don't know whether it's intentionally or not, for some of, uh, of what we're doing here. By, by ridding yourself of 
within your personality construct, you're going to be opening yourself to more possibilities. Um, so uh, does anyone have some questions about the path I've seen? So I, I want to mention a couple of things um, about the recordings. Um, uh, the appropriate perfume, Alex is asking about that, so I'm going to jump in on that, and then I'll, then I'll get back to what I was about to say. The appropriate perfume for this is uh, fiery essences. Um, uh, you know, my, my fire incense would be good. Uh, um, cinnamon. Things that smell hot and peppery are good. Pepper itself is actually fairly toxic, so it's not a good idea, even though it's suggested in some grimoires, to use it uh, for, for Marsy type things. Um, uh, Rebecca, if Champa seems fiery to you, that's fine. To me, it seems more floral and almost watery. But uh, if, if, you know, if it evokes a fiery and um, transformative by fire kind of a feeling for you, then by all means use it. You know, that's not, um, uh, I, I don't, personally I feel like what is, it, what is evocative of the, of the state is, or the, you know, the, the element is more important than any traditional correspondence. So, you know, if for you mint seems fiery, <laughs> you should use it. If, if for you, if, you know, musk seems uh, watery, then you should use it. You know, the, they're, they're, um, it, what, what, how it affects you is more important in my mind than um, what a traditional correspondence is. Because there's, there's been many, many correspondences for almost every product that's out there. You know, I mean, you can find, um, you know, a, a reference to almost any planet within things. And there's less references to the elements um, in, in the literature in general. Um, so it's it's a little bit more open there anyway, um, but um, that being said, I would recommend trying the traditional things before you move on to you know your own thing because there there is a certain amount of historical and um, power within it that's been developed by its you know continued use you know the the fiery spirits are used to being called up by certain things. So if you call them up with other things, then they're going to be like, well, I mean, it does smell kind of fiery, but I, I, I'm more used to the other. So um, Oscar says, so if I understand right, as we work with the paths, we get rid of personality baggage. Um, well, yes and no. I mean, that's that's a component of it. You, you, you open up to a, uh, a more complete version of yourself with, in which the personality baggage is less relevant. Um, you know, I mean, you can get rid, you know, just like anything, you can put something down and you can pick it back up. You know, like uh, every non-smoker is one cigarette away from being a smoker. So, you know, there's no, there's no, there's no really putting down. There's, there's getting clarity about things and so that it's not as much an impact in your life. Um, The, uh, and Rebecca's mentioning that, that she has a lot of champa. So, I mean, you know, Rebecca, here's the thing. If, if, you, if you want to just use one scent for this and it's just going to be evocative of your, of your work in general, that's fine. You don't need to, you know, have a, a, a distinct scent for every single one of these paths if you don't want to. It certainly adds a layer to it um, that, that um, particularly if you're planning on doing other kinds of ritual magic, that relates to the energies of these paths, um, it's useful. Now, um, it, the other the other incense choice is to use one that has to do with hut, in which case you can use sandalwood, or um, some some people put benzoin in there. I think a Siamese benzoin or something. Um, so there's you know uh, there there's two two main choices there. You know the the one of the path and the one of the of the result. Um, there's one that's more right than the other. Certainly, um, if, you're, if your aim is to understand the path more than the path one, if your aim is to sort of move into the, the Sephira more, then use the Sephira one. Um, Rebecca uh, wants to open her nose to more possibilities, so sure. 
sure. I mean, you know, get out there and explore. Um, and you know, there's lots of there's lots of stick incense that's quite appropriate for these things. Um, some of it is maybe sort of synthetic, chemically stuff, and I don't think that's really the right thing to do. But if you find some good stuff, like if you go to um, certain places, I, I don't, I haven't really bought incense from Whole Foods. So I don't know if that's um, the best choice or not. Uh, but there's, you know, there's places where you can find stuff that's actually made with, at least with essential oils. So, um, in general, about these recordings, uh, I wanted to mention something that someone uh, asked me a question about off the list or off, or, you know, outside of this thing, um, and, and that is my sort of uh, non-conventional pronunciation of the tetragrammaton, um, and. What that was was in a in an inspired state. I was I was given that a way of pronouncing that would be to use the five vowel sounds um, in in English um, to sort of connect with the many different vowel related um, God essences that are possible within that name. And so, it, if you if you look at it, it actually has the different five vowels in it, along with the letters. So that's um, uh, the the essence of where that came from. Now, um, Rebecca is mentioning that she goes to head shops that have good sense. So, um, sure, okay. <laughs> uh, the um, the other thing is that. Um, Uh, Oscar's asking, uh, yes, that's that's the Tetragrammaton. Yahweh, Jehovah. Those are other ways of pronouncing it. But within these recordings, um, and you've heard this, Oscar, because you've listened to some of my other stuff too, I have a very unusual way of pronouncing it. Um, and so that's, that's what I was referring to. Um, so... Um, each of these recordings begin in a in a very similar manner, and and as as we're going along, we're going to be doing this for 22 sessions here, and and hopefully you're going to be listening to um, all of the recordings as we're going along, and those are um, you know, and and hope I'm hoping that you're going to at least like I said two or, or more times during the intervening time, and especially since we're going to be having them biweekly some of the time. Um, Definitely two, two or more times, and uh, the uh, the the beginnings of the recordings are are quite similar to one another. They're not identical, but they're but they're very similar. And I don't want you to start feeling like they aren't an important part of it, and that there's something to be got past to get to the part where you're doing the path working, because I actually think a significant amount of the important work within these path workings is that first part. That Kabbalistic invocation is, is an extremely um, transformative process that is one of the favorite, my favorite things that I've created. I, I think I mentioned that last time, too, in that it, it is both, it, it has three components. It's an induction into a, an altered state of consciousness. It's it, it's a it's a metaphorical and and you know um, Ericksonian uh, guiding into a um, a more divine state of consciousness and it, and it also has the um, the divine names in a in a progression through your body to transform you on a on a sonic and um, spiritual level so it's it's an extremely important part of this. And I want to see you guys utilizing that to its fullest potential and really trying to get the, the, the meat and the marrow out of that each time that you listen to it. Um, uh, Oscar is asking where, how can we listen to the recording later? Are you, are you referring to the recording of this class or are you referring to the, to the path working recordings? Because the path working recordings are, are on my website. I'll, 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 I, I think that you'll be... Actually, I think at the end of this, you'll, you'll either go there or you'll go to a, um, a question questionnaire, and then it goes to there. So, um, 
so Brendan is saying this is a very proud, powerful recording. Wow, enjoyed it. Did you, are you talking? You listen to the Path of Sheen? Is that is that what you're referring to? Um, because uh, you, you're very right to have noticed that it, that the death and rebirth one is related, although very different, obviously. But but they are, but they are in fact covering similar territory. There's a recording within the New Hermetics called uh, Death and Rebirth, and it too covers the idea of personal transformation into a more eternal place. Um, uh, the, the, the printed invocation of the um, that, I, that I created, I don't think I have it um, available anywhere publicly. Um, uh, but, oh, uh, so uh, we're, we're just asking about that. I will. Uh, I'll think about how I want to handle that. Um, you know, it's it's something that I'd rather have you doing along with the recording, even if you're missing some of the words, rather than reading along with or something like that. I don't think that it's as powerful that way. Um, if you have questions about something that I've said, if I you know, slurring my words or something, and you're not understanding, go ahead and ask me, and I'll give those to you. But I, I think I, the reason I, I haven't printed it and given it out is because I don't feel like it's that useful for people to, to be doing, um, you know, reading along with it. Um, so uh, Oscar wants to know both how to get in touch with this recording and how to get in touch with the path working. There's a page on my on jasonaugustusdukum.com that's that's called Path Workings, um, and it has all of the path working recordings, and then it has the first recording of this of the of the previous class, and then by tomorrow it will have this recording of this class as well um, there on the site. So you should be able to find them all pretty easily. Um, Uh, Rebecca says she's eager to listen to them. Um, and so there's two recordings, Rebecca. And if you don't, and I think you have the 30 second pathwork. I thought I saw your name as someone having downloaded that one. So um, if you're, if I'm wrong, let me know. Uh, but there's been a number of um, codes that I've given so that people can have that one for free. So um, ask uh, Brendine or Kevin if you uh, if you don't have one of those. I'm sure they must have it in their email somewhere. Uh, so Robin says. Uh, the Kabbalistic portion, when repeating out loud, can feel them internally, and when vibrating the names, even more so. Yeah. So I want to um, I want to uh, encourage you to actually verbally say those things aloud along with me. And like I said, if you're if you're getting lost in it or feeling like you're getting behind, don't worry about it. Just let it just let it wash over you at that point and sort of catch up with it. I mean, there there are times in which I I use it and um, I'll kind of go internal at a certain point, usually right fairly towards the beginning of it, um, when it when, right when it's entering the cosmic matrix of the skull, I'll sort of lose my ability to verbalize for a short time during that time period. Um, and it, it's fine. You know, just pick it up when you are when you're able to. Um, uh, so uh, so, Brendan and Kevin, what I want you to do is um, I want you to work with this recording a few times until our next time. So, my my intention for these classes is for um, we we will you know this from now until the next class is when you'll be working on the path of Sheen, and then from the next class, the next one, you'll be working on the path of Resh. Um, so, um, it's fine if you want to listen to them beforehand, but that's you know kind of. The, the trajectory. So um, I want you know, to discuss your experiences with the path of Shin next time, um, and then and we'll discuss you know doing the path of Resh that time. So um, and Robin says very powerful to do it with the recording uh, combined effort, so to speak. And and that's and, and that's really my intention with these recordings is to create something in which. You know, I don't I don't want to enslave you to the recordings, but but to create something that's a little bit more than just um, that would then would be available to you otherwise. You know, I've, I've, that's why I've combined these sort of sonic elements to it that you know that are specific frequencies, so that you are being kind of transformed as you're working with them. Um, Alex says, 
Uh, Jason, I know you're running out of time, and I just want to remind you about the Ascent Johnson. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. Oh, and I do see we're running out of time. Um, so terrific. Uh, uh, Rebecca is saying uh, thank you for something, I think, T-Y. Um, and OK, so Rurik asked a question here. Um, Speaking aloud pulls you out of deep trance suggestions. Well, one, um, I don't necessarily want you to be in a deep trance where you're so out of it that you can't function. Um, two, uh, there, are, there are aspects of your consciousness that are standing in your way of being able to be, uh, being able to be and be free at the same time. And so that is part of your path right there. That is something to work on letting go of. You know, limitations that say I can't verbalize unless I'm, you know, in a certain uh, place in my consciousness. Uh, you know, there are there are numerous people throughout history, myself included, who go into um, a trance uh, in which they kind of prophesize and they don't have any recollection of that experience. Their voice and their conscious mind are completely separate from one another, one another for that time period. So it certainly is possible, I know, from my own experience, to be able to speak and not actually have any conscious functioning of your mind at all. And it's simply a matter of allowing that to take place. And it's something that's, that's a, a function over time. So just, uh, just allow yourself to sit in that, in that zone as often as you can. I actually think that one of what an extremely useful tool for that is is that image streaming or the uh, visionary flow number three in the um, the uh, synergistic meditative flows, in which you are allowing yourself to move into an altered state of consciousness, but you're verbally describing the things that you're seeing in your vision. That helps to connect you with that ability to be in, a, in, a, in an alternate place, but also still have the, the verbal function remaining. Um, I, I think that it's something that, uh, you know, if you, if, if you were to sit with me when I'm doing something like that, like whether it's the, the, you know, the, image, the image streaming or whether it's this, you're not going to hear me speaking in my voice like I am now. It's not. That's not the voice that, that's going to be used. It's going to be more like, um, you know, my consciousness arises as a spirit of blood. You know, and and as it goes on, as I become more entrenched in that vision, my voice, my my uh, words are going to be more slurred and going to be more odd and, and out of out of touch with um, the physical world. At least if I'm trying to go really, you know, deeply into that state. So. Um, Feeling like you have to speak in a certain way or at a certain volume or in a certain, um, you know, clarity. Don't worry about that. Um, but there, but there is power that you're creating by expressing things outwardly and not going completely internal. You're you're creating a connection between those higher states of consciousness and the physical world. So you know, I I, I recommend up the skill. So Rurik says, "Thanks. This helps a lot. Thanks." I hope I hope it does. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I just don't put too much pressure on yourself. And uh, Robin says there's also power in speaking the divine names. Yes, I mean the the divine names are um, you know specifically uh, magical words that that have a particular vibration to them that you know that is very intentional um, and very you know ancient. Goes goes most of them go back before. You know Judaism as we know it. So um, they're they're very primal names.
going to, to set you on your way for this uh, next. Oh, uh, before I let you go, um, I just want to say, and Alex, I'm going to do my absolute best to get the sigil done today. I, I started saying that before your thing even popped up. <laughs> um, but, uh, the, uh, um, the next class is going to be in two weeks. Um, and then the next class after that is going to be